Can we think of prosperity as a rope, intertwining how we evaluate life and life's satisfactions, how we experience life, and our purpose? That is, being able to put our gifts to work. Does happiness have a genetic component? Let's take a closer look. This is Prosperity and Something Greater. My guest today is Dan Butner. As you'll hear, Dan and I have been friends for a long time. I first met him in 1995 when he spoke at the first Connected Classroom Conference, which I helped run, and that was being held in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Dan was a sponsored keynote speaker who came to share his story about traveling the world and helping K-12 through students experience the world through his online adventure, Maya Quest. Now, this is before anyone had heard the phrase online adventure. And you'll hear him tell you about those quests in our talk. In 1986, Dan and his brothers launched out to create the first of several Guinness World Records for transcontinental cycling. And you can actually read more about those journeys on his Wikipedia page, and I recommend it. In April of 2008, Dan released his book, The Blue Zones, Lessons for Living Longer from the People Who've Lived the Longest. It became a New York Times bestseller, and his Blue Zones project was launched. And Dan has studied health, happiness, and longevity, and has a wealth to share on these topics and how they might relate to prosperity. I know you're going to enjoy and learn from my talk with my friend, Dan Butner, just as I did. Let's meet him. Okay, well, welcome, welcome everyone to today's podcast. And I'm really happy because I've got a, I don't want to say an old buddy. We're actually really only several months of long time. age. Yeah. But a long time, long time friend, Dan Butner. Hi, Dan. How are you? Hey, Rem. Great to see you again. I have to say you never age for crying out loud. Whatever you're taking, I want it. Well, good. I, uh, I just pay attention to what they tell you to do in the blue zones and that's been working yeah. for me. So anyway, I told everybody all about Blue Zones in the introduction and and all of that. I was reminiscing with you just a moment ago about the very first time we met. And it was in Baltimore, Maryland, Hunt Valley, actually, at the very first Classroom Connect conference. And that was a company I used to work for where I met Dan that was really all about how do educators use the internet, K through 12 educators, how do they use the internet when the internet was new? And Dan had been already started on this journey, this quest of his to help students, you know, solve mysteries online. And Maya Quest was one of those, uh, was the very first of those kinds of mysteries. I mean, of course, you'd been around the world on your tours, but you came and you spoke that night. And I remember you showed us pictures of the Atacama Desert and all the things that you were doing. And, you know, it's been a long time since those days. And I'll let folks know. I helped a little bit, but uh, Classroom Connect eventually purchased your company and we worked together and that was a blast. I really owe that whole chapter to you because I remember you saw me, we connected and you introduced me to the incoming CEO and said, I was going to run out on a meeting and you said, no, no, stay. You, you should, you got to meet this guy. I quickly took a meeting and that meeting led to another meeting, which led to Classroom Connect acquiring my company, Quest Network, and really 15 extraordinary explorations that an online audience of kids directed to solve great mysteries around the world. So thank you again for that. Oh, it was such a joy to be involved in all of it. You know, you were down in the Galapagos with Jean-Michel Cousteau and you were in the Great Rift Valley, all those places um, over in China. And, and I was back in the, in the, uh, in the bunker, you know, uh, doing my part to help with all of it. One time I remember it was China Quest and they said, uh, 
hey, CBS News wants to get some sound about this thing. And who can talk to them? And I, and and, because there's nobody, everybody's gone. You were there. I said, well, I'll do it. And so I talked to the guy in CBS News. And then the next day I was in a, a, a shuttle from the Marriott over to the airport, wherever I was. And, you know, the music came on and there was CBS News talking about you and it was me. And, and, and I was like, you know, Marco Polo said I only told half of what I saw, but recent research would suggest he only saw half of what he told. And yeah, yeah they're well put. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just uh, really those are fun times. I don't know. I don't think I knew how much fun it was at the time, but I look back and think how lucky we were to do the kinds of things that we do. I can remember you. You know, you, you had those satellite phones, and and that was like. Who knew these had been invented? And you know, could you could come in and the kids would direct you where to go. I remember one time you said we can go to this dig or something else, or we can descend into a Mayan skull cave. And it's like you're going down in the cave, yeah. right? <laughs> that was yeah. Yeah. Had a pretty good idea. But the internet was new, and t- teachers were trying to figure out how to use it. And and uh, I think the two of us really, uh, you, you were more on the end of helping teachers kind of get their arms around the whole internet and. I had just an exciting app before there were apps that let yeah. um, their their students. We discovered that kids didn't just want to passively read. They actually wanted to have a say. And uh, the idea that they could send National Geographic photographers and, and uh, Harvard archaeologists on a real expedition to solve a real mystery and have that incorporated into their social studies and math and science and and uh, language arts was was a brand new idea, and we were the brand new frontier, and we got to sort of be out the front of it. And I loved every last second of all of it. And then I was recounting with you before we um, we we went live that I remember you visited me back in Orange County, uh, California, where I lived, um, because our headquarters were um, right there near LAX Airport. And you spoke to me then about an idea. You certainly hadn't named it Blue Zones yet, but you had, you know, you'd really done some work. I think it was when you were in Okinawa, I think on a quest or something, and you saw these these folks that lived to be so long, uh, live so long and so healthy, at least that's my memory of that. And you talked about this, and now, you know, all of the Blue Zones, the books and the National Geographic articles, and you're on television all the time, and I've just been, it's so much fun to watch your journey with all of this. I mean, if you recall, it was just so much, you know, I mean, what's the Blue Zones experience meant to you? Well, as you point out correctly, it grew out of a, a quest in Okinawa. We, we every twice a year we had to find a great mystery to solve, and we we found a report from the World Health Organization that that uh, reported that Okinawa had the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world, which means people are living a long time and not getting sick. The first quest was just cursory, but I got to thinking, well, wait a minute, this group of people they don't have any special genes. I mean, it was a melting pot like America is. And uh, they're not all on diets and they're not all taking supplements, but there's something going on here that is leading to extraordinary long and vital lives. And I reasoned if there are places in Asia like this, there must be places in Europe, and North America and South America. Pitched the article, the idea to National Geographic and uh, got funding from the National Institutes on Aging. And I think the thing we did different is there, from everybody else is we worked with demographers scientists who can confirm ages of populations. We really did our homework for a couple of years to, to make sure we found these areas, which I dubbed blue zones, where people are living statistically longest. And then it took a while, but it turns out there are scientific methods out there to distill common den- denominators and correlates and the, the really the factors that explain longevity everywhere and uh, for the, the the cover story I wrote for National Geographic, I've actually written a couple, and uh, the Blue Zones books, uh, my job was to really distill that in enormous body of, of wisdom from the Blue Zones around the world and put it in a prescriptive kind of a, a guidebook for Americans to, to follow so they can benefit from the years that they can be getting. And it's been enormously satisfying to me personally. I'm 104. And I feel great. <laughs> you know, oh, if you are, then I am too. And, uh, I forgot to check. But, yeah. 
Well, and then that that also led, I mean, I'll just tell everybody, one of the great things about Dan's books, he's also just got a, a new cookbook out, the Blue Zones cookbook, which I was telling Dan we eat from all the time. And that's all those recipes you've distilled from around the world where you've really found how people are eating and how they're taking care of themselves and being healthy. Yeah, it, we tried to make it a step beyond a cookbook. So I took a, a National Geographic photographer, David McLean, who I think you might know. We first worked with Harvard to do what's called a meta-analysis of all the diets in all five blue zones. And by the way, the five blue zones are Sardinia, Italy, longest of men, uh, Okinawa, Japan, longest of women, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, the Seventh-day Adventist in California. They live not too far from Los Angeles. And then the island of Ikaria. Those are the five places where people are living the longest. And if you want to know what 100-year-olds ate to live to be 100, you can't just go find 100-year-olds and ask them because they don't remember anymore. Like, Rem, can you tell me what you had for lunch a week ago Tuesday? It's usually the same thing. So probably I could, but generally, no. I don't know what I had for dinner. Yeah, yeah right. But, but you kind of know my point. I, and so I'm sure the people here listening. Right. Well, you, you can't really ask a 100-year-old what they're eating when they were five or and as a teenager and then early in their career and when they retire, et cetera. So we, we pulled dietary surveys done in these areas um, and then uh, averaged them, aggregated them in what's called this meta-analysis. And we found uh, the same food trends. They're eating mostly grains, greens, nuts, beans, and tubers. That's the blue zone diet. But they know how to make them taste delicious. So we found mostly older women, women in their 80s and 90s, who've been cooking the same way for decades. In fact, they're carrying forward, a, in many cases, a 500-year food tradition. And we really pay careful attention to not only the ingredients, but also the preparations. And so we know this food is yielding 90, 100-year-old healthy people. Uh, we captured the flavors, the techniques, and then David captured the images, and, and we put it in the Blue Zone kitchen. And it's been an enormous success and, uh, and uh, very satisfying. It's a beautiful book. It is absolutely gorgeous. And every recipe is super. So that leads me to the, the next question before I kind of get into my prosperity questions that I want to ask you. But you wrote a book called The Blue Zones of Happiness. And, you know, that's really in the wheelhouse of what we're talking about today. And I wonder if you want to just share a little bit about, you know, about that. Sure. In the same way that you can reverse engineer longevity, I reasoned you could reverse engineer happiness. So working with Gallup, that's done surveys in 156 countries, representing about 95% of the world population, we were able to pinpoint the areas where people have the highest life satisfaction and the highest positive affect, which is how they enjoy life. Once we identified them, I took a small team there to, once again, parse out what's going on that explains this longevity. And much of, I mean, that ha this happiness, and much of this work involves uh, statistics, something called uh, regression analysis. You can find out by surveying a representative sample of the entire country. We know they're happy, and then we look for the factors that travel along with that happiness. Because I work for National Geographic, we have to be able to tell science stories using images and using characters. So it was essentially a statistic story, but told through the lens of a country that experiences the highest levels of happiness. Well, I think it's great. I love the book. And it's interesting because that kind of folds now into prosperity. And as I had mentioned before we, we went live, that I become very interested in what is prosperity. And when you look at how it's measured or it's what's really hard to do, like they look at countries and the things that feed into it. Part of that is the happiness of people, the health of people, the wealth of all of it. But happiness is, is a component inside this larger idea of prosperity. And so I want to ask you, uh, we'll just go straight to you then. How would you, Dan, after all your travels in the world and all your life experience and all that you've studied and researched, how would you define prosperity for you? Well, you see, I, I'm mostly for the books and so forth. I, I'm kind of held to, to evidence and the word happiness 
is actually a meaningless word because you can't measure it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a sort of vague thing. But what social scientists can measure is your life satisfaction. And the way they do that is, is they uh, ask you to imagine a ladder with 10 rungs on it. And they say your best possible life is on rung 10 and your worst imaginable life is on rung one. Where would you place your, how satisfied you are with your life? And, you know, you can probably think, and maybe Rem, you want to take a second to think of your life as a whole. How would you rate your life on a scale of one to 10? Oh, I'd give myself a 10. Okay. That's, that, you know, that's extraordinarily high. When I ask you that question, you probably in a snap, you think back and you say, well, I'm married to Diane, a great wife. Uh, I have a really successful business. I help people. I have three great kids. But it's more an evaluation of your life rather than a sum of experiences. You actually only remember about 2% of your life. You tend to remember the high points when you married Diane or the birth of your child and the low points. You know, maybe you got dumped by a girlfriend or, or uh, grand, your grandmother died or something. But we don't really remember the things in between. So social scientists measure that by asking people to remember 24 hours. Remember I asked you, can't, can't remember what you had a week ago Tuesday for lunch. But if I asked what you had for lunch yesterday, you could probably remember it. And if I ask you to recall how often you felt joy and how much you worried and how much you laughed, you could probably remember that. So in a series of three times, I can ask you how you're experiencing life and I can average those. So, so you get how you evaluate life with life satisfaction and then how you uh, experience life with these 24-hour questions. And then finally, there's a, a question about purpose. And that question is, it asks you how often you're able to do the things you do best. And that kind of gets at, are you putting your gifts to work in your everyday life? And when I think of like, prosperity, I think of it like a, a rope that braids together um, experiencing life, my purpose, and how I'm evaluating life, you know, that life satisfaction question. I think in the same way your financial planner will tell you to have a balanced portfolio with cash and stocks and bonds, you should be putting equal energy into both how you're experiencing your life, living out your purpose, and doing the things that are going to make you proud in the rearview mirror. So that's how I define prosperity. And I know it's a little long-winded, but uh, I did a lot of thinking about that. That's not long-winded at all. And that is, thank you. I will spend some time with that and think about it. And you know, it's interesting. I had that reaction. Uh, I want to give myself a 10. And you might say not too many people do that. They're usually delusional. Yeah, right. Well, sure. <laughs> but I believe it with you, Ram. You're different. Yeah, right. But you know, for me, though, that was such an easy question to answer because I actually made a choice about that a while ago that today I'm living my best day ever. And every morning when I wake up, I smile first and I, I remember all the blessings that I have because I've got all the problems that you know we all face. I have the struggles, all the challenges, but I start with the blessings and then I work with my subconscious mind all the time. And we have a relationship. I learned that from Napoleon Hill. We just make an agreement that our number one goal today is to have our best day ever. And when you live like that, you know, stuff happens. We all have stink bombs. We all have the things that happen. You get the thing that could make you angry. And, and occasionally, I don't hit the high mark. But my primary goal is to make sure if this was the last day, it's a great day. And so I just feel like that's the way my life is. And that's why. It, it, but it's a choice. I'm not naturally, I'm a positive person, but I'm also a person that can worry quite a lot. And I've pretty much banished that from my, my life. As a guy who's known you for more than two decades, I can tell you that you are a generally a positive up person who goes through life helping other people along. But you know, we know from international twin studies that when it comes to your day-to-day -day happiness or your overall happiness, about 40% of it is dictated by your genes. You know, some people are dealt a bad hand genetically and, uh, you know, on their best day, there are six and on their worst day, there's a two. And other people are dealt a really great hand genetically. And on their best days, there are 10. And on their worst day, there are six. So 40% of how happy you are is your genes. 
about 15% of it is chance. Now, if you were born in Syria or you were born in Afghanistan or you had chronic pain or, or crushing depression, you can't overcome that by looking yourself in the mirror in the morning and say, this could be my best day ever. You can make it a little bit better day, but probably not going to make it a 10. But to your point, and this REM is what I think you're really getting after, you know, about 45 or 50 percent of your happiness is up to you. And what I tried to do in the Blue Zones of Happiness and a story I wrote in National Geographic was identify the long term things you can do to stack the deck in favor of happiness. And there's a few things because, you know, there's a lot of kind of pappy books done on positive psychology appreciation journals and savoring and writing letters and so forth. And those interventions probably work, but they only work as long as you're paying attention to them. Once you stop writing the appreciation journal, it stops working. And a lot of us forget or we run out of discipline or we get distracted. But there's a few things you can do to set up your happiness for the long run. And one of them, for example, is make a happy friend. For every new happy friend that you bring into your immediate social circle, and this is the friend who cares about you on a bad day, your own chances of happiness go up by about 15%. We also know that where you live has an enormous impact. We know that by following immigrants who live in unhappy places like Moldavia and Africa. And when they move to happy places like Canada and Denmark, nothing changes. Their gender doesn't change. Their sexual preference doesn't change. Their genes don't change. Yet within one year, they start reporting the happiness level of their adoptive home. So we know the aspects of a happy place. A happy place tends to be walkable, a walkable neighborhood. It tends to have trees. If you live near the water, uh, you're 10% more likely to be happy. We know happy places that people feel generally equal, and they feel like they can trust their neighbors, and they can trust their leaders and their police. And so we can... We can proactively seek that out. So, Dan, we all have challenges and obstacles we face, every single one of us. Can you share a little bit about your own journey? Like, What are the things that can trip you up? Well, so uh, much of my success, I would attribute to almost an irrational optimism. And sometimes we wake up and we're tired, or sometimes we wake up and we've said no to unjustly, or someone... Sometimes we're treated unfairly. You know, I got fired. You know, I came up with the quests and ran them successfully. And one day I, out of the blue, I got fired from our CEO. And that hurt a lot. In fact, people, you, you get fired, you lose your, uh, it's, a, it's a blow to your self-esteem and you lose your social network. And, and that, that was probably one of the lowest parts of my life. And I, especially since I didn't feel like I deserved it. That tripped me up a good, a good, good deal. But then if I wouldn't have gotten fired, I would have never started Blue Zone. So like many things, bad things that happen to us, they often appear in our rearview mirror as, God, that was a blessing. So, you know, I'm old enough now that I know that when, when bad things happen, they're probably going to lead to good things if you just sort of have patience and stay the course. You know, I've observed that in my own life. Almost every single time there's been a setback or a problem or a defeat, it comes back to where you really just say, wow, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I had to do what I did and something greater came out of it. Um, Top Practices was born of absolutely that experience. I tried to do something else. It just did not work, but I had sorted it all out and I thought, you know what? This is a path that has heart, and and I believe I can make a difference. And I'm so glad that you know that um, happened as well. So I mean, I can, I mean, I remember that experience for you. You know, we we hung out during that time, and yeah, no, you were you were a loyal friend, and you know, here 18 years later, we're still talking. That goes a long way. Well, I, I did everything I could. I was like, you know, I, I put myself at risk because I was like, no, no, this is no, and uh, it, it didn't matter. Nobody listened to me in, in some of those regards. Well, this has been great, Dan. I, I, I want to ask you a question I've been asking everybody, and it's just a fun question. But if, if you were a toy, any toy at all, what toy would you be and why? I would be a ball. First of all, it's spherical perfection. Secondly, anybody can afford it. 
Third, it is that the core component of every sport we love, football, basketball, baseball, soccer, it uh, encourages physical activity. You get to soar through the air. Uh, you get to be that thing that people can take their aggressions out of. You can be the thing that scored the goal that makes a whole community joyful. So, And everybody in the world can have one. So I want to be a ball. <laughs> That's a, it's great. I absolutely love that answer. Absolutely love it. And I didn't even do my homework. Yeah. <laughs> Shh, no one knows. Uh, one last question. If you could recommend just a great book that we we should all read, you know, one just yet, you know, I'm forcing you to pick one book that you would think would be great for people to read. What would that book be? Journey to the East by Herman Hesse. It's a short book. It's a fable. And it helps you understand the importance of leading from behind and the importance of being a servant. And it's all in a wonderful story. Herman Hess, or do you say it Hesse? Is that how you say his name? Yeah, that's how the Germans say it, but it looks like Hesse, H-E-S-S-E, Herman Hesse. He won the Nobel Prize in literature in the 30s, and uh, he wrote Siddhartha, which is another one people might know. But it's a little-known book called Journey to the East, and it's a wonderful fable. Anybody who seeks to be a leader should read it, but it's also useful for just how to be a guide, a guide for, for your life. He's my favorite author. I've read all of his books, Magister Ludi and Gertrude and all the Rosa. Rosa Step Prince. Wolf. Oh, yeah. I just adore Hermann Hesse. Hesse. I'll start saying his name the way the Germans do. I didn't know that. I don't know how I came upon him. I've read Journey to the East, and I couldn't agree with you more. Wow, what a great, what a great recommendation. Dan, it has been so much fun catching up with you, my friend. It's been as much fun for me to just watch your journeys. You've always been on a quest all the way back 30 years ago, by the way. It's the 30-year anniversary of your great journey um, of riding, you and your brothers riding your bikes from Minneapolis to St. Paul the long way. This is the, the yeah. 30th anniversary. <laughs> Around the world, that's right. I, I'm impressed that you know that. And that got you yeah. in the, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records and David Letterman's show. And uh, that was really the sort of the, the kickoff of, uh, wow, we could do something here. It really was. It's been a joy, absolute joy. And as I said, when you get out here near the Red Rocks where I'm at in Las Vegas, I want to spend some time with you. That would be absolutely lovely. So, Well, I've been thinking of bringing my kids' college fund out there and double down there in Vegas. You know, just put it on red. And bam, they're, they're either going to an Ivy League school or a community college. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> Nothing. I, I Listen, we need to talk about that plan because there's a reason these buildings are so big and beautiful. And it's not, <laughs> it's not because you win when you come here. You have a good well, time, but. Mm. I, I, but it's fun for me because it's my airport. And so every time I fly home to Vegas, the, it is just a raucous party and people are up and talking. And when we yeah. fly out, we can't wait to get to bed. <laughs> when, when we fly out, it's like you're, you know, you're going to a funeral. Everybody just sits in their chairs and they're very quiet. <laughs> they're exhausted. They're both my savings. Yeah. They're not, they're not living the blue zones life when they're here. That is for sure. So my friend, you know, happy travels, safe journeys, and I will catch up with you soon. Delight to see you, Ron. Continued success. If you're lucky, you might meet someone on your life journey who has a remarkable ability to truly lean into life and make a difference in millions of others' lives. In my life, that's Dan. Dan continues his Blue Zone mission and has helped transform entire cities into healthier, happier places to live. I recommend you read his books, cook his recipes, and find your own path to health, happiness, longevity, and prosperity. Prosperity, flourishing, and thriving. Weaving the bands of life satisfaction, life experience, and living your purpose in balance with yourself and your environment seems like a guidepost to prosperity to me. Let me know what you think. You can send me an email at rem at toppractices.com 
Prosperity is the entire focus of top practices. Most doctors are struggling with the business of medicine, and those that aren't truly understand that through association with other successful practitioners, they can take their success to the next level or something greater like prosperity. Prosperity in business is a function of mindset, marketing, and management, and that is our mission at Top Practices. You can find out more about Top Practices, our marketing and management programs for doctors, our workshops, and our annual summit at toppractices.com. Until next time, this is Rem Jackson. Smile when you wake up, and then have a really great day. Nothing is more important.